Okay, Eric Mendelssohn, happy birthday, Eric. So I, we forgot to sing happy birthday, Claude Nicolas Ledoux, but we'll, uh, we, can, we can think of doing it now. So happy birthday, Claude Nicolas Ledoux, and happy birthday, Eric Mendelssohn. 1887, 1953. So he died at 66. And um, he was born, let's see, about 150 years after Ledoux, maybe a little more than 150 years after Ledoux. Certainly uh, 81 years after Ledoux died, Eric Mendelssohn was born. So Eric Mendelssohn was a German architect, <clears throat> as opposed to Ledoux, who was a French architect, known for his expressionist architecture in the 19, in 1920s, as well as for developing a dynamic functionalism in his project for department stores and cinemas. Mendelssohn is a pioneer of, a, of the Art Deco and Streamline modern architecture, notably with his 1921 Mose House design. I don't know. This is what Wikipedia says. Uh, this was the man. Uh, and um, yes, a, a versatile and uh, interesting architect. Uh, <clears throat> but, but in his case, maybe as in the case of other so-called uh, great, no, I shouldn't say so-called great architects, maybe sometimes their wives have a role which is not as acknowledged as it should be. This is a picture of them, of uh, Eric Mendelssohn and his wife. And I don't know, this, this picture makes me think, you know, if I look at this picture, what do I see? We, I see, we see the architect looking with, uh, with uh, interest in, uh, to the profile of, of his wife and his wife is looking intensely towards us, the viewer, the viewers. And um, he probably adored his wife and it's very possible that uh, for his wife, Eric Mendelssohn was a child. <clears throat> and uh, it's very possible that uh, <clears throat> the important architect uh, was uh, somehow not only inspired by his wife, but maybe also uh, directed a little bit because she seems to have, a, to be a woman of will, of strong will. Other pictures of it, of them. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> so, um, an interesting pair. They seem to, uh, to, to have formed a, a, good, uh, a good pair. Here he is again, uh, Eric Mendelssohn, not to be confounded <clears throat> with, a, <clears throat> with a composer, with a composer who was also a very, very important cultural figure. Some drawings, some of them are very expressionistic and exalted. And, uh, you know, the kind of sketches maybe you shouldn't try to do in school if you don't want to have troubles uh, with, um, with the authorities. Or this one, look, I mean, this is a, clearly an exalted uh, drawing, maybe too exalted. These are as well. And look at his signature, uh, exalted as well. But these are futuristic. I mean, this is not uh, expressionism. I mean, there is to an extent, but this is futuristic architecture. Uh, Mussolini might have built this. A study for the Einstein Tower. I keep saying, and I should say to myself, you don't have clients, you don't uh, have connections to get clients, but you have paper and, 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 and pencils, right? Express yourself or do it digitally. It can be done digitally as well. And you don't even have to cut trees down to, to, to make paper in order to, you know, express yourself architecturally. This is a building from 1913, today known as the Mendelssohn House, is the house where he was, uh, he was built, uh, he was born. It was not a house, um, I don't think, I don't know actually, was it built by him? 
No, no, maybe it was built by him, his first residence that uh, he built for himself and, and his family, his wife. Uh, this is not wild, but, uh, but um, it still has, if indeed it is the house he built for himself, uh, I look at it differently. If I didn't know it was for him, by him, uh, maybe I would have seen it. You see it here with a different, um, uh, different tiles and different color of walls. I guess refurbished, um, restored. Work hall of the Hermann Hat factory. This is a fine work from 1920. So he was 30 something when he built this. Look at this, you know, it's a hat. It's a hat factory, but you might say this is a temple. What are you talking about, a hat factory? But in a way, a hat is uh, the culmination, no? uh, the culmination of one's head. It is the transition between a human being and the sky, no, the hat. And uh, so as such has a, um, you know, a celestial uh, dimension, so to speak. And that's what we see here. It's, it's the, the cosmicization, if I can say so, of what the hat is. You know, the coiffure and the hat. And the, here we have an emphatic roof, a very emphatic roof. It's powerful. It's a powerful architecture. And even, even at, the, at the level of the lower part, you know, yes, it might be accused of some formalism, but look at the interior. Not bad. And it's actually very similar to a building by Albert Kahn. <laughs> they didn't know of each other. I mean, maybe, uh, maybe uh, I don't know actually who was born uh, before or after between the two. But it's a very fine uh, industrial building here designed by Eric Mendelssohn. The structure is honest, uh, is uh, vigorous, is cultural. The light is fine. The perfect place to work on hats. Too bad it was uh, deserted at one point. I hope they restored it. And being Germany, I imagine they did. In fact, they are restoring right now in this very picture. A look at this building. If you saw this image, would you have said this is a hat factory? <clears throat> I doubt it. You would have said it's some kind of a temple. But it's not at all. It's a temple for hats. Why not? Why shouldn't we have temples for hats? And hats. We see geometry. We see the, <clears throat> the triangle. We see... Uh, it, it's it's fine. <clears throat> Eric Mendelssohn, the you know functionalist expressionist uh, architect. Look look how he employs the triangle, you know, uh, to emphasize a dynamic, uh, uh, you know, invitation into the building. So <clears throat> this is an early work by Eric Mendelssohn. Uh, now we arrive at maybe his best known work, the Einstein Turin Solar Observatory on the Telegrafenberg in Potsdam, 1917 or 1920, 1921. And then the technical equipment was brought in, in 19, from 1921 to 1924. The tower's expression is form is suggestive of concrete as a building material, but it is mostly brickwork rendered. Mendelssohn explained this. This was because of delivery problems. However, there may have been difficulties in constructing the formwork for poor concrete. So uh, in the end, he settled for brickwork, but it looks like concrete. You have seen this building, it's, it's very famous in the history of modern architecture. And it is indeed considered an expressionistic building. So it is by Eric Mendelssohn and <clears throat> it has the name of the great scientist Einstein. It is an observatory, but someone who saw it 
it wasn't me. Someone who saw it told me it's actually much smaller than you'd expect. It's, it's not a giant building. In fact, you see the trees are almost taller than it is, than the building. So it's, no, it's not a big building. But it has somehow, it gives you the illusion that it's a monumental building. It is very well designed. This view is uh, less less known uh, and uh, it's interesting, I think. Yeah, this is the contemporary or almost contemporary interior with computers. The Germans take care of the, you know, they, take, they, they take care of everything. And in this case, they take care of, of a building which is uh, important for, uh, for architecture. So it still functions as an observatory, the Einstein Tower. So the Einstein Tower designed by the German architect Erik Mendelssohn is one of the best known examples of German expressionist architecture, designed as an amorphic structure of reinforced concrete. But we know it wasn't just concrete. Anyway, Mendelssohn wanted the tower to represent as well as facilitate the study of Einstein's rad radical theory of relativity, a groundbreaking theorem of no motion, light, and space. Astrophysicist Erin Finlay friendly commissioned Mendelssohn, along with a young Richard Neutra on his team, to design the Einstein Tower as a research facility for the theory of relativity. Between 1917 and 1920, Mendelssohn made numerous sketches of the facility, attempting to create a dynamic structure which would give form to Einstein's groundbreaking theories. The, re the resulting plan revealed a centralized observatory tower, banded by rings of windows raised on top of a wave-like platform that would house the laboratories. Influenced by the work of expressionist artists at the time, such as the painter Vasily Kandinsky and designer Hermann Obrist, Mendelssohn began to search for new methods of construction that would allow expressional freedom, which is why he eventually settled upon easily sculpted reinforced concrete as his material. This is what he said, uh, Einstein, uh, Mendelssohn, every building material, like every substance, has certain conditions <clears throat> governing the demands that can be made on it. Steel, in combination with concrete, reinforced concrete is the building material for formal expression, for the new style. The relation between support and load, this apparently eternal law, law will also have to alter its image for things support themselves, which formerly had to be supported. Towers mount and grow out of themselves with their own power and spirit and soul. So uh, this expression for things uh, uh, support themselves, which support, which formerly had to be supported. I am thinking somehow of the students who could support themselves. I'm not talking necessarily in the field of finances, but in the field of uh, creativity and, and, and learning, you know, they, I think students can, can learn by themselves quite well if they are encouraged to, to do so. 
building commenced in Potsdam in 1921. Unfortunately, however, the sculpted concrete structure proved difficult to execute with the technological capabilities of the time. The failure to complete the building according to his original plan prevented him from designing such ambitious projects in the future. And the, and the Einstein Tower remains his best known building. The research center opened in 1924 and held the most important solar observatory facilities until World War II, when it was severely damaged. In 1999, the building was reopened in honor of its 75th anniversary, following two years of renovation. Today, it houses a working solar observatory as well as a visitor center. Ah, it's a long, uh, it's a long text. In the years following its construction, the Einstein, Einstein Tower, a potent symbol of expressionism, figures centrally in the German architecture debates about whether architecture should prioritize expression or pure functionalism, as represented by the international style. While it's, un, it's clear today, almost 100 years later, that functionalism would dominate Europe's built landscape, the Einstein Tower remains an interesting, a unique counterpoint to the modernist style. Also is interesting is not just the architecture, but also the apparatuses that uh, exist here, you know, in connection with the function of the building. It's in a way a small temple for science. This is what it is. At first, you don't notice that he's actually sitting on um, some kind of a base, a platform covered with grass. Also interesting is the fact that it is not a dead monument, so to speak. It is active. Activities take place within the building. If you look at the plan, it's almost like the diagram, the silhouette of a human being, almost with a, the approximate relationships between the head and you know the middle part of the body and uh, you know then the legs, at least at the ground level. Everything is designed, you know, everything in harmony with the whole. But he built many other buildings, so we have to rush a little bit because we still have to present uh, Albert Kahn. Now, this is the house. Uh, that uh, it was mentioned as being uh, quintessential for uh, who he was. If we can call it a house, it's, uh, it, that's how it, it is called in German, but it's actually a department store and uh, it's quite, uh, quite big and it still exists. It's not bad, but it's not, you know, dramatically. Uh, in fact, it incorporates, you see here and here, it incorporates maybe even existing buildings. I imagine at least here there are existing buildings.
the Schocken, Schocken department store in Nuremberg, 1925, 1926. Uh, the red flag textile factory in Leningrad. He also built in, uh, in, in Russia in, in, and the uh, Soviet Union, and uh, just like Albert Kahn as well. So author offered the building of the power station of the factory. The other buildings were uh, authored by this uh, Russian architect. And he was um, um, an architect who was invited, uh, I think, to, to, to build a complex of buildings of these factories, including the list of the objects of historical and cultural heritage issued by the government of St. Petersburg in 2001. It's not bad, and uh, although it needs some some repair, but it's not bad. Uh, in Stuttgart, a department store. This was a very fine building. Unfortunately, it was destroyed. In 1960, the city of Stuttgart demolished the store despite international protest. Mistakes happen, unfortunately. It was an excellent building and it was demolished. Eric Mendelssohn in Stuttgart with a building that does not exist any longer. Now, uh, cinema in Berlin from 1925 to 1931, uh, you know, uh, almost a typical Eric Mendelssohn architecture. You can relate it, I think, easily to his drawings, you know, a vision, a round, uh, rounded uh, platform or base and then uh, various volumes, not too many, a few volumes that uh, intersect and, and so on. Even the interior is, I think, modern, you know, considering that it's 100 years old. This was uh, the drawing, the visionary drawing, so to speak. Another department store, 1927, 1930. Eric Mendelssohn, indeed. Now, maybe for us today, it doesn't you know, shock us or impress us too much. But you have to understand, this was almost 100 years ago and uh, even now I think it has it has the power of modernity in a way his own home 1928-1930 in Berlin it is a prism it is a cubicle building but then he has the expressionism of this platform here uh, that, uh, you know, uh, creates a distortion, uh, a displacement in a way, and something dynamic. It's a fine house. He had good taste, so to speak. Now, I don't know if this... This is not uh, now a foundation or a museum, a mini museum for him, for his works is possible. Now, uh, this is uh, from uh, 1921, 1932, uh, 
Uh, this is a little bit unclear because uh, because of its name in Columbus House in Potsdamer Platz in Berlin, and there was uh, there was another building called Columba, Columbia House in also in Berlin, which was demolished in 1937. Another department store. He was indeed uh, the architect of, uh, of many department stores. A Jewish Youth Center in Essen, 1930-1933, but I don't have pictures for it. Uh, then he left Germany because of the troubles that were already uh, beginning to show up. So he went to England first. So he, he collaborated with Kermayev and he, they built this house in England, a uh, big house. And then uh, uh, another partnership with Serge Kermayev, uh, a pavilion. This one is very well preserved and is yeah, almost a typical Eric Mendelssohn because of this you know, part of the building which is curved and otherwise the building is rather rectangular. Uh, this one is near the sea, so it's uh, near a uh, vast expanse of water, and uh, you can see it from far away. A very nice uh, staircase. It is helicoidal, but uh, it's, it's distinctly elegant, including the entrance into the building. The canopy above the entrance is also, you know, dramatic and interesting, sculptural. I almost feel tempted to think that it wasn't him who designed it, that it was, you know, Pierluigi Nervi or something. Another house in London, again in partnership with Serge Kermayev, later renamed Hamlin House, and restored and extended by Sir Norman Foster. I don't know, maybe Foster did this, it's possible. Another house, but this one near Tel Aviv before the Second World War. Very interesting house, very different in a way, more static and more, um, I don't know, it's something hierarchical about it. It's um, uh, more static, but um, it has a mystery somehow. I mean, looking at it, you'd say it must be some kind of a religious building, but it's not. Or it is, I don't know. It's quite a big uh, building. If it was a private residence, it's, it's quite big. The Hebrew University in Jerusalem, 1934-1940, uh, you know, uh, large campus. This kind of um, canopy uh, can deliver to, to an appreciable extent. It's very fashionable these days. Jean Nouvel does it uh, from time to time. And uh, I, Mendelssohn did it uh, 
with a half a century at least earlier. Maimonides Hospital in San Francisco, 1946-1950. But unfortunately for this one, I don't know why it doesn't, I don't, I don't have pictures. I hope they didn't demolish it. The Park Synagogue in Cle Cleveland, Ohio, in Cleveland Heights, Ohio, immediately after the Second World War. It looks like an observatory. But you can see uh, the relationship with the Einstein Tower somehow, although it is a larger building, a different function, but and uh, even formally, aesthetically, it is uh, somewhat uh, different. But uh, I, uh, there is its spirit makes me think. Uh, now it's also true that I know, I know uh, the same the same architect. Well. That one, the Einstein Tower was, were, for, was built for silence. This one uh, for science. This one was built for religion. Another synagogue in Maryland, again, without a picture, the Russell House in San Francisco. So he moved to the United States. Strange uh, things here, this, uh, you know, round, uh, you know, corner, and even these windows are strange. But strangeness is um, 